Hello. Today, I have the pleasure of having Philip Chase on my channel. This is a huge, huge honor for me because I have been a longtime subscriber and commenter on Philip's channel, and he is lovely. I've actually been on his channel a couple of times, and I have been so, so eager to have him on my channel. Uh, thank you, Philip, so much for joining me today to discuss Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien. Well, thank you, Joanna, for having me. And I, I, you know, you just mentioned that it's my first time on your channel. And I, I guess you're right. I mean, we've had some great interactions. So I did, I, I guess I didn't realize that this is my first time. But yeah, it is. Um, I've so, actually had Yeah, and I'm very excited this. to be here. I've had your nemesis on my channel. <laughs> and I still haven't yeah, had you on my channel. How come you had AP before you had me? <laughs> I don't That's know how that terrible. happened. <laughs> You had Professor Fireballs before Dr. Fantasy. Oh. Well, I guess you saved the best for last, right? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, so um, I am so pleased to have Philip, though, because I, as I explained in several videos already, I just recently read and finished The Lord of the Rings, and I did read some of this as a teenager, and for whatever reason, I felt like I was under some sort of Lord of the Rings curse. I never finished the complete Lord of the Rings, whether you describe that as a trilogy or a standalone. Actually, Philip, do you consider it a standalone <laughs> or a trilogy? I like to go with what the author says. And Tolkien is very clear that he regards it as one story. So uh, I'm, I'm, I usually refer to it as one book or one story because that that is how he thought of it even though it's divided by publishers that was actually i think a publisher decision to divide it into three books but it's also divided into six books in a sense too because each of the three has two uh, parts to it so but yeah he i think he thought of it as one story mm, yeah okay interesting yeah and i it's it been a really pleasurable experience to read this as an adult. And I've been telling people, if you haven't read this even as an adult, then I highly urge you to do so. That ship has not sailed, so to speak. <laughs> you could definitely appreciate this, I think, at any age. And you would probably agree with that, right? I mean, you've reread re -read this several times in your life. Yeah, no, I, I think I was 12 or 13 the first time I read The Lord of the Rings. And my father had introduced me to it and I introduced it to my daughters uh, my my younger daughter read it when she was 12 uh, so um, it's sort of a family tradition I guess at this point but uh, I, I just can't describe how important that book was for me at that age uh, it was and by the way I agree with you that you can read it at any age because I reread it have reread it many times as an adult but at that age, when I was 12, 13, boy, the phrase that I've used before is it, it baptized my imagination. And in so many ways, I, I think the course that my life took, uh, this might sound crazy or extreme to some people listening, but I would have to say that my life course has a lot to do with reading this book at that age and being so taken by it, so moved um, by what I was experienced, I, I, it was my first experience of touching the sublime. And it moved me so much that I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write, I wanted to do what Tolkien did. I wanted to do that uh, somehow. And so I ended up, you know, wanting to be a writer, but also knowing that I needed a day job. Um, so my day job became, and I didn't think this sort of consciously, I just did it, but my day job became studying, um, Old English and Old Norse and the things that Tolkien said, because I probably somewhere in my head thought that to be a, a great fantasy writer, you, you had to know a bunch of dead languages and, <laughs> and uh, be, be immersed in, in um, that sort of lore. But uh, I don't actually think that's necessary today, but, but I'm happy that he took me along that, that course anyway, um, because uh, I, I've enjoyed it very much. But, but yeah. yeah, so it was just, a, I would say, one of my two most important reading experiences of my life. Yes. The other one being, of course, <laughs> Malaz and Book of the Fallen, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, I would say Malaz and Book of the Fallen uh, and the, the entire, really, the whole Malaz and world, everything by Erickson and Esselmont. Um, so that, that's been my more adult, I guess, 
experience uh, of a read that has just shaken me to my core in the best possible way, giving me a sense of transcendence and uh, just a, um, a beautiful sense of the sublime. Yeah, so those are the two most important reading experiences of my life. There's a lot of other great reading experiences too that, that uh, I've had in, within fantasy and, and outside of the genre. But uh, if I have to say the two biggest experiences, I would say those two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I definitely see what you mean about the sublime in Lord of the Rings. I wasn't sure. It's so interesting because I, when I started, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and talk about the book as a trilogy for a moment, but of course I do think of it as a complete story now, now that I've finished it. Um, yeah. It's just an interesting, it was an interesting journey reading this or rereading part of this as an adult because starting off with the Fellowship of the Ring, I was so I was so inspired by his depictions of nature and the beauty of friendship and some of the I don't know I just I think those were the things that really really inspired me. I found myself wanting to go outside more <laughs> and just appreciate what was around me more. Um, it was just so beautiful. And then the second book, The Two Towers. I am I mistaken? Is Helm's Deep? Helm's Deep is in The Two Towers. I yeah. constantly for some reason I. I feel like it's kind of a darker tone of a book in a way. And mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because I hear people nowadays who have said that maybe the Helm's Deep chapter doesn't um, appeal to them as much as adults. And, you know, that maybe they're, <laughs> I heard AP say that actually, you're an emesis. He said that maybe that uh, chapter <laughs> was not. That, <laughs> <laughs> well, he said that he still enjoyed it, but that maybe he appreciated other parts of Lord of the Rings um, as well now and yeah. that maybe he didn't appreciate when he was younger. And as for me, uh, I have to admit, I loved the Helm's Deep chapter as an adult. I I definitely did. I don't know, it's weird. I, um, I was talking about this because I have a couple of fantasy friends who are not into sieges and battles and things like that. And I can understand that to some extent. Sometimes I'm not as into those scenes either, but I think that the way that Tolkien writes battle scenes like in Helm's Deep and even actually in Return of the King, they are so, I keep using the word immersive lately, but <laughs> they are, Good they're word. very atmospheric and they yeah. just, I don't know, just the way he, he brings them to life. I feel, I just, they have such a strong contrasting sense of tone in those, um, in those parts. So I felt like the two towers definitely showed me that, like a darker tone and especially with Saruman, much more development there. And mm -hmm. towards the end of that book too, of course, with a Shelob, and then going into Return of the King, um, I definitely found that dark tone continued on with certain battles there. Um, yeah. But I, but just the whole end of the book, the whole journey with the mm -hmm. ring, uh, the last second temptation with the ring, um, Gollum's fall, everything after that. I I was telling Philip, I'm like, this is kind of embarrassing to admit in a way, but it felt almost like a spiritual experience for me because yeah. I yeah. just, I felt my heart just grow bigger than my body in a way. Um, yeah. It was so, so beautiful. And even just the whole journey back to the Shire and the things that developed along the way there. And then the very end, I, I could not stop the tears streaming down my face. So I definitely felt touched by the sublime, as you've mentioned. Yeah, no, I think you you described the experience beautifully. And it's interesting because what you're describing is uh, exactly what Tolkien talks about when he defines the word you catastrophe in his essay on fairy stories. And this is, <laughs> ta -da, there you go, yeah. This is a very important concept for Tolkien. And what you're experiencing is what I experienced both as a 12 year old and every other time I've read the book. And I also cry, by the way, <laughs> every time I get to the end. And there is just something so beautiful and moving and tragic and joyous all rolled up into one there. Uh, because there is sorrow and there's loss. The the elves leave Middle Earth, and you know their the characters have died, and and there, uh, you know there are things that are that are gone. That will the ends, you know, and and all these other things that uh, part of this magical past that are, are are passing away. And so there is sorrow, but there is this 
almost uncontainable joy of the Yu catastrophe, which is the ending of the book. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Each of the books in the trilogy gets darker and darker until that moment of Yu catastrophe at the end when, I mean, look, Frodo and Sam going into Mordor together and, and their, their journey with Gollum much of the way is, is some of the, the, the most painful, toughest, you know, <laughs> reading. I mean, that's just torture, uh, but, but we get a happy ending and that's very important for Tolkien's philosophy, what he calls you catastrophe. Um, and this is the idea of the joyous turn, the sudden almost uh, divine event that uh, takes disaster and turns it into triumph and turns it into joy. Um, so this was a very important thing for Tolkien, who was a man of very deep faith. And it's very much related to his, his Roman Catholic faith, his belief in the, the sacrifice uh, at the core of Christianity and, and the salvation of humankind. So this was something that very much inspired him and it was something that he wanted to, it's not allegory or anything like that, but it's just an element of the story that was very important to him, that there be this almost salvific, joyous turn that changes the story from tragedy to something of beauty. So yeah, that's, and, and I agree. Yeah, it gets darker and darker and darker until you hit that moment. Yeah, it was interesting. And just going off the end of this uh, this essay that he wrote, or I guess this was a this was originally intended to be a lecture is what it says here at the beginning. Yes, um, yes. And it was abbreviated and delivered in 1938. Uh, anyhow, I think it's interesting. I just, this is a fascinating uh, little, you, I actually downloaded this for free online. I just looked it up and I found a PDF of it. So I just yeah. printed it out. You could buy- Mine's in the Tolkien book. reader, yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, I need <laughs> it. It's Tom Bombadil. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's neat. I like that cover a lot. Yeah. yeah. I remember Great. when the movies came out and just being horrified by all the movie covers of the books that came out at the time. I was just- <laughs> Same here, same yeah, here. Yeah, I was so horrified. So I love my my like old kind of vintage edition here. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, what was I gonna say about this though? Yeah, it's just interesting what you said though, that this uh, eucatastrophe, it doesn't negate the sorrows and the grief that happens too. And that was right. something, I think that was also, that's also maybe part of why this is so emotional at the end too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think you really miss that if you just watch the movies. <laughs> I don't know if that's a controversial take or not, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that Peter Jackson, uh, I have some criticisms of the movies. By and large, I like what he does. He's a fan, I think, and he tries, I think, to give that bittersweet feel at the end. It's not nearly as, as um, powerful as the book is for me, at least personally. But I think he tries that at the end with, you know, Frodo and Sam and then Frodo leaving along with Bilbo and, and going on the last ship sailing out. And, and that, that sort of, you know, when they, um, Frodo looks back longingly at Sam and you feel that loss, you feel that, uh, that, that, that pain there. So it's not all just, you know, sunshine and roses there at the end either. Um, That's true. But, yeah. And it has been a long time, by the way, since I saw the move the return of the king movie anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah so i'm really excited to see what my reaction will be to that i know with the two other movies though i did love that i do love those movies and i'm not trying to uh say that yeah. they're bad in any mean by any means they're fantastic adaptations but i do yeah. think that i prefer the books um more than the movies and uh even though they are masterpieces and i'm so grateful for them too i'm so grateful yeah. for the especially because of the soundtrack <laughs> that soundtrack is beautiful and oh yeah Howard Shore's soundtrack is, is brilliant and I I have all the uh, CDs from all three movies and even I did I tell you this I went to a, a live at Lincoln Center once I went to a live performance of the soundtrack from Fellowship of the Ring um, and the orchestra was playing along with the movie so we were watching the movie while hearing a live orchestra oh, playing no. Wow. And conduct, it was uh, one of my uh, 
just favorite experiences of my life. Oh, it was that fantastic. sounds amazing. I'll have to, yeah. I hope I can have that opportunity someday. <laughs> that sounds yeah, I, don't, I hope they're still doing that sort of thing. It was a thing they were doing a long time after the films were out. Um, and I, I can't recommend that experience highly enough. It was just such a great thing. And they do all three films, but I happen to, if film wise, my favorite film was Fellowship. Um, actually, um, of the three films, um, for reasons we don't really have to get into here, but um, but uh, yeah, it was just it was really something to be there live and have the music, and it, I got tingles up and down my spine. <laughs> I bet. Wow, that sounds fantastic. Um, yes. I have a few questions based on what we just touched on. So I know people are constantly talking about this idea that Tolkien. I mean, that Tolkien has discussed this as not being allegorical or not right. being in favor of allegory. And you said that this was not allegorical. And I want, I wondered if you wanted to add, touch any more upon that point, because I know that I've heard uh, from people who say that this is definitely a like Catholic <laughs> allegory of some sort. Um, <laughs> I've heard yeah, that. I know. Have you yeah, heard there there have been a lot of readings of it uh, along sort of allegorical or symbolic lines, like the ring is the nuclear weapon and that sort of thing. And Tolkien was very consistent in, in insisting, no, it's not like that. Um, and I believe him. I don't have a problem. I mean, the thing is, I, I think that readers can bring their own interpretation to a text as well, and that's perfectly fine. So what I believe is that Tolkien did not intend for this to be allegory. And that, that I, I, why not take him at his word there? Um, I, I don't think we, it, it needs to be. It, it, a, a story like this can convey truths without having to have a, you know, symbol for symbol correspondence to anything. So mm -hmm. I, I just think that it's its own story and it tells the same truths that you can experience with real world stories as well. And, and we can relate things that happen, like, for example, the worship of power and the ring as a symbol of power. Um, I, that's a perfectly, you know, great way to approach this. Um, but that doesn't mean the ring equals, you know, nuclear weapons or something like that. So uh, I, I don't think that um, we need to be so literal in our interpretations because that has a, when we get too literal with our interpretations, it has a tendency to freeze the text and not allow further interpretation. So personally, I, I prefer to take Tolkien on his word and, and take the story as story, um, but it has a certain resonance, let's say, with many other stories and, and it contains really beautiful themes that you'll find in, in other stories as well. So that, that's my take on that anyway. Oh, okay. That, that's really interesting. I, I think that you are absolutely right that it can still touch on truths without it having to be like a symbol for symbol type of story. That makes perfect yeah. sense. And I think that's exactly what he was going for. And that seems to be my take from what I've read, even in this uh, essay, as well as, you know, just my experience with the text. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think that that's, um, and he's famous for saying that he even dislikes allegory. So <laughs> yes. whereas you take his friend C.S. Lewis and the Narnia tales, and I think it's much easier to, for the Narnia tales to support an allegorical interpretation because C.S. Lewis was, I think, much more deliberate in his, uh, the symbolism that he wanted to incorporate into his story. So I would not argue with somebody who read um, you know, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as an allegory of the story of, of uh, the uh, sacrifice of, of Christ and, and uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, but, um, you know, that, that doesn't mean you have to read it that way either. You can take it as a story um, as well. So that's the beautiful thing about these stories is they, they can function on so many different levels. Yeah, excellent. And then another um, thing I was thinking about too, as we were talking about the movies is how in this, uh, and I don't know, this is possibly on my part a misinterpretation, but it seemed to me as though he was critiquing drama. I mean, it seemed that way, like he was critiquing drama <laughs> in comparison. You mean to Tolkien? Literature. Tolkien, yes. Yeah. I I think Tolkien wrote a few times that he's not a big fan of drama. 
um, as in theater and, the, and that sort of thing. And it's not his favorite medium, I think. Um, and I think he had a problem with the idea of adapting Lord of the Rings into something because for him, I think the, the idea was that because you couldn't achieve um, the, the right effect, you couldn't achieve a, 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 a compelling or real feeling um, that it would come across as kind of cheesy and, and that it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It would, you would destroy the illusion that you're creating in the process of what he called sub-creating, his sub-creation idea, which he also talks about in that yeah. essay, Grey Stories. So the idea is maybe, maybe he felt like he would just pop the bubble there and, and it would destroy the effect. Um, I honestly would be very curious to know what he might've thought of Jackson's Lord of the Rings adaptations with, at the time, at least the, the CGI and everything else. And they had a lot of other special effects that I actually like more than the CGI, but I, I do wonder what uh, Tolkien would have made of it. Uh, having been on the record for a long time saying, I just don't think it's, you can do it. In fact, you probably would mess up the story by attempting to portray a dragon on a screen or on a stage or, or that sort of thing. So I think that's how he felt um, according to at least what I've read, but yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was kind of what I, gathered from this. Um, it was weird because it seemed like he was strongly critiquing uh, drama at one point. And then later on, it seems like maybe he wasn't. So I got a little puzzled on some things, but I did wonder that. I remember reading part of this and thinking, wow, I wonder what he would think of these movies, if he would agree, or maybe he would change his views on that because they were done so well, or you know, I don't know. It'd be, I'd be curious too to hear what he would think about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, we'll never know, obviously, for sure. And I know there are members of his family who some expressed some disapproval of what the films were doing and, and that sort of thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. You you can um, hear. I think it was it Simon, told, a grandson anyway, who's who. He felt that his grandfather would not have liked the films, and he, he expressed that publicly a, a time or two. But um, uh, anyway, it's it's uh, you will never know for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I've been delighted. I can tell you how I felt the, the when I watched the Fellowship of the Rings. I was very very nervous. I thought oh, they're going to mess it up. Well, this is Hollywood; they'll never get it right. Um, but I I was felt compelled to check it out. And so I watched in, uh, was it 2000, 2001, um, when Fellowship of the Rings? That Ring sounds right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was spellbound in the first five minutes. I was kept saying to myself, like a little kid, they, they did it. They got it right. You know, this feels like Middle Earth. And it was just this, I can't believe they did it. You know, and, and uh, you, I just knew right away that Jackson was a fan of the story uh, and that he'd really taken care to um, portray the Shire uh, as Tolkien, as I envisioned Tolkien envisioning it anyway. So, uh, so yeah, I was, I was just delighted when I saw the first film. I didn't like the subsequent films as much, but I still liked them. And part of the reason is I think the CGI elements started taking over more and more um, as he got, I think Jackson got a little too enamored with the CGI stuff for, from my perspective anyway. And it, it went to a, just a crazy extreme in the Hobbit movies, which I think were not nearly as good. It's pretty universal consensus there um, because they strayed a lot further um, in terms of not, I'm, I'm fine with uh, obviously a film ad that adaptation has to be different from a book and it's a different medium. So I'm totally cool with, you know, them having to, it's fine that there's no Tom Bombadil. It's fine that there's no scouring of the Shire and all of that in the films, not a problem. But what they did with the Hobbit was I feel like they changed the essence of it more in order partly to just drag it out into three films um, <laughs> uh, so I had problems with that, but also just the, the CGI elements. It was like he was playing with a toy and, and it was just for the sake of the toy a little too much, I thought, but anyway, that, that's my take. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the casting of the Lord of the Rings movies? Did that live up to what you were imagining? Um, casting wise, I was pretty good. I, I thought, um, I like Viggo Mortensen. I think he's a great actor, 
but I would have maybe liked somebody a little bit older to play Aragorn. Um, but Mar Martinson pulled it off really well. Um, obviously, um, Ian McKellen as Gandalf. I mean, I think in many of our minds, Ian McKellen is Gandalf now. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so he was perfect. Uh, you know, Frodo's, Elijah Wood did a great job as Frodo and, and the other hobbits I thought were, were really great. Um, Mary and Pippin were appropriately comedic. And you can tell they had a rapport, I think. Yes. That's not something even a great actor can always fake is the, is the rapport among them. And I thought that they, they were a nice fellowship um, in, in that sense. So yeah. Sean and Boromir, great choice. Um, obviously Christopher Lee as, as Saruman, such a great choice. Mm -hmm. um, he's the perfect Saruman. Plus he's also famously, or was, he's passed away, but he was a, a huge uh, Tolkien fan as well. Oh, so, um, wow. I yeah, cannot so, remember the actress's name who played Galadriel. Um, oh yeah, uh, Kate Blanchett. Uh, yes, yeah, she's you. brilliant. I just think she's a, uh, I mean, outside of Lord of the Rings even, she's a fantastic actor. Um, yeah. And I thought Liv Tyler did a good job as Arwen too. And um, yeah, so I mean, just a, I thought the casting was great um, uh, for the most part. I, I, I can't even think of, who's the guy who plays Wormtongue? Brad Dourif oh, or something like that? Yeah. I'm, I don't remember the name. <laughs> I mean, they have a lot of good actors in that film. The guy who plays Theoden is actually a Shakespearean actor. Um, his name escapes me at the moment, uh, but he, great actor. Uh, yeah, they did a just fantastic job. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. It was a fantastic movie. And I think you're right about their rapport with each other and everything. They did, I think they famously all got matching tattoos after filming or something. So that tells you something. bonded yeah. for life there. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. Well, I have some questions uh, that I have here about Tolkien. And if you're okay with answering these, these come from, there is a read along that's going to be starting soon over at Ryan and Kristen from Seeking Stories channel, the channel Seeking Stories. They will be hosting the Lord of the Rings read along. I just found out about this. Well, I kind of knew it was coming while I was already reading the books, but I definitely wanted to shout them out and say, hey, if you want to read these books or if you want to read the Lord of the Rings, the standalone, <laughs> however you want to look at it, definitely check out their channel, join their Discord. And I went ahead and asked if they had any questions um, about this topic. And if it's okay, I'll go ahead and ask some of the questions that Ryan sent me. Okay, I will, I'll do my best. To... <laughs> That's all I ask. Help me too. You, you, why don't you help me too as well? I'll, I'll see if I can. I don't know if I can, but we'll see. Okay. Um, so one question is, why is Lord of the Rings largely universally embraced while so many other works of Tolkien's contemporaries do not receive acclaim at the same levels? Hmm. That's a good question for you, actually, since you study fantasy so thoroughly. Yeah. Well, I think some are, I mean, if you look at, well, he's a little bit earlier, actually, like Robert Howard's Conan stories, for example, um, that's, that's a different branch of the fantasy family, if you will, the sword and sorcery branch. Um, but yeah, no, they're, they're, it's true that I think Tolkien is just looms large in the genre. And why is that? Well, uh, because he did not invent fantasy by any means. Um, like I said, there were people before him, long before him. In fact, Tolkien was um, very much inspired by the, the guy I actually wrote my dissertation on, which is William Morris. Uh, and he wrote some, what we would call fantasy, they called them prose romances uh, back in the 1890s. Um, and even before him, there was George MacDonald. And uh, even, you know, there's, there's a whole history that we could get into there. But the question is why, why is Tolkien regarded as such a uh, huge figure? Why is he so popular? Um, and it's tough to say why a certain work comes at the right time and triggers this huge reaction. It, there are very few in the history of literature that you can point to and say, wow, this, this really had a big effect on the genre. I mean, more recently, I guess for, for you know, uh, more at the YA level of the genre, you have the Harry Potter books, which made a huge, I mean, whatever you think of um, them now, I mean, there's no arguing about how important uh, an impact she had on the genre there for a long time. Um, so 
Um, and it, lots of people grew up loving those books. So why do certain books have this, you know, right time, right place, I guess uh, there's that, but there's also something I think about the Lord of the Rings that calls to us. You and I both experienced that when we read th these books, we experienced that elation. We experienced that, that sense of transcendence and we experience a great deal of sorrow and joy and, and the beauty of middle earth. Why does middle earth call to us so strongly? What did, you know, what did Tolkien envision here that is so appealing to so many people? And I think it has a lot to do with uh, our own longings, our own innermost desires. And I, I think it has something to do with uh, our evolution as a species because Tolkien is tapping into something very, very, very old here. And something that we kind of got out of tune with or out of touch with because of industrialization and capitalism, we kind of removed ourselves further and further from nature in some ways. And that is something that Tolkien taps into very much. There's a very um, rural agrarian um, sort of uh, bias in, in Tolkien's work that I think is, is um, important. It was important to him. So that's a big part of it. He speaks to, uh, um, I think a part of us that longs for a sense of unity, that longs for a sense of belonging, that, um, you know, this is something we go through our lives with this sense perhaps that we're, we're, we're not quite where we belong and, and uh, we're seeking something, we're seeking something. And I think reading Lord of the Rings gives us the feeling that we're on the journey, at least, of, of finding this thing that is so elusive that we're seeking. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think all those reasons. I mean, what do you, what do you think? What, how would you answer that question? Oh, I think you answered it so beautifully. I completely agree with you um, about the longing. And I just think it's fascinating because that journey and that seeking, um, how, it, you know, how it sort of echoes to the past and I know I've heard you say before that that's something that is very distinct about the fantasy genre is that it is sort of an echo of the past or allude, you know, alluding to the past, whereas maybe sci-fi might be to the future. Um, so I think it's interesting that it is a sort of uh, that journey, that longing takes us to that direction. And I mean, I think that's, you know, that definitely makes me think of the romantic era a little bit, like what you said. Um, yeah. that's why I always say that I feel like I'm like a romantic at heart because I love the romantic era for all of those elements, like the nature and fantasy and mystery and realizing that the world is much more vast or the universe is much more vast than like we would have thought before, maybe in the enlightenment era or the classical era. And so it's just, um, I think that that all those things definitely apply and it's something that seems universal and doesn't seem to be going away. It seems to be just as relevant today which is why, you know, me living in this uh, 21st century, I'm still having tears roll down my eyes reading, <laughs> reading yeah. the return of the king. Um, yeah. But something yeah. else. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, just uh, reacting to you. And um, maybe for that moment, when we're at the end of that book, we, we feel whole, you know, there, like we feel like we've we found a home <laughs> for a moment there um, in Middle Earth. Uh, so yeah. It's yeah. a beautiful experience. It really is. I just the, I I think beauty is is one word that always comes to mind when I think of Lord of the Rings. It, it really is. It's it's a beautiful experience. And so, yeah, I, I think that's uh, those are major reasons why this book, this story, struck such a chord and had such an influence because people wanted to have that experience again. They wanted to get lost again in in, in a world like this and. Yeah, and it's uh, it's been tough to find something for me exactly like it, and there is nothing exactly like it. But but to repeat that experience of the sublime is something that uh, that twelve year old me wanted to very much to experience again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I I mean it's interesting. I um, I sent you that excerpt that one time with the with Kant's sort of. Uh, philosophy of the beauty and the sublime. I'm sorry if that was too nerdy, but <laughs> for me to oh, say. It's wonderful. Yeah, could please talk about that? Because I think it's great. I think your viewers would love to hear about it. Oh, right? yeah. Well, um, you know, and I'm not a philosophy expert by any means. I just studied it for a brief time in my life. And I know that one thing that I study, I actually specifically studied aesthetics. And 
one of the things that I learned from my professor at the time about Kant's aesthetics and from this book by Monroe Beardsley is that Kant basically looked at aesthetic experiences um, and in two sort of ways, and this is how I understood it, so I apologize if I'm oversimplifying Kant, but that he looked at the beauty, there's the beauty and there is the sublime. And so the beauty is, is bound. It's kind of like when you look at a beautiful flower, you, you have this beautiful experience because of its simplicity of seeing how all the petals are organized and coming together in this beautiful design um, that sort of just brings you, binds you, it binds you in. And then the sublime is kind of like the notion of looking out at the stars and just taking in again, like how uh, vast the universe actually is and our small place in it and having this sense of awe and wonder at that, there, that there's a beauty, there's a, an aesthetic experience in that of just of that sense of wonder and amazement and how big can it get? How much further can it go? Or even looking at the ocean that, and not seeing anything on the horizon and just feeling like it can go on forever. And I just always think about people in the past before more of the world was discovered and when they'd look out at the ocean, what that would mean to them. So just that sort of boundlessness. So whereas the beauty is in the bound and the sublime would be sort of the unbound. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I love it. Um, yeah, I think you had mentioned all this to me in the context of me mentioning how Tolkien baptized my imagination and Erickson freed it. Um, yes. Yeah, so I just, I think that's so beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that and I'm sure uh, I'm sure we're going to hear some comments on that. That, uh, and I think you explained it wonderfully. So thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, it came to mind, especially when you said that, and you spoke so beautifully in that video about that. If I ever said something like that, like that, Tolkien baptized my imagination, it would sound so contrived. But when you say it, <laughs> it just sounds so beautiful. <laughs> I, I don't think you would sound contrived. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah. 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 Um, and. Um, yeah, where is, where, let me think where I was going with that. Mm. Yeah, I lost my train of thought about that, but <laughs> but yeah, oh yeah, I guess the idea here is that with Malaz and Book of the Fallen, um, just the idea of how it sort of, it, it sort of like you said, it unbound you. So it's sort of like the sublime experience, whereas Tolkien is maybe more of the beauty experience, but I think yeah. you can find both in both. It's not one or the other necessarily. It's just, you might find it's a little stronger in one area or the other. Maybe there's a spectrum too. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I would agree with what you just said there um, that you can find both beauty and the sublime in both of them. But I think you're also right that um, there's a distinction and it's useful. And I think it might be true now that I'm thinking about it that I, brought, I would associate beauty more with Lord of the Rings and the sublime more with Malaz and Book of the Fallen. So yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a fair, but that they do contain both. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Buy that. I'll buy it. <laughs> Wonderful, excellent, yeah. And I mean, I love the study of aesthetics um, just because I think that the more that you look into it, it it's just amazing, the human mind and um, how many aesthetic experiences are possible that there isn't just one type of aesthetic experience. Uh, there are many types of aesthetic experiences. And yep. Tolkien does have just such a very, very distinct type of aesthetic experience that for whatever reason seems very universal. But I do think that you made a really good point about the timing of when it came out, that maybe sometimes mm -hmm. some works are going to be recognized more for the timing in when they, when they appear. I think about that all the time with uh, Amadeus Mozart and how he was this child prodigy, but he was also a product of his time and society and the fact that his father had him at the piano or at the violin learning music constantly. So that sort of led to him developing his aptitude to the level it did and maybe why he became who he was. If he had lived in a different time period, then maybe that would have been different. And then there's also some question too about his sister, Nanerol, and whether you know, maybe she could have been a better musician if, um, if at that time period they had promoted female artists as well. So you never know about these things and the timing. And just speaking of the timing, um, you know, you mentioned that, that, and it's interesting because 
Let's see, when was Lord of the Rings written? I probably need to look up the year again. Do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, you know, it was published in 1954, I think. Um, and he was writing it for quite a while, actually. It took him a while to finish writing it um, through possibly late 30s, definitely in the 40s and, and into 19, the 1950s. But it became popular, really, really popular when it crossed over here to the United States in the 1960s is when it really blew up. So interesting uh, because, of course, I, you, here you have this very staid Oxford professor wearing jackets, like, sort of like what I'm wearing now. He's, you know, a very conservative looking fellow. And he, his, his Lord of the Rings was immensely popular with all these hippies uh, here in the United States uh, in the 1960s. And I'm sure with hippies over in the UK and elsewhere, people with uh, that sort of that mindset. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 yes, it was the right time for it because... Who, I mean, who's the best hippie in the whole world? Gandalf, of course, right? He's, I haven't he, thought about it that way, but nothing to bring And Galadriel, Gandalf and Galadriel make, are the perfect hippie couple, I think. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I know it, it's obviously, I think that uh, a lot of people were trying to return to nature and uh, that's part of the, the message of Lord of the Rings, a very important part of uh, what he's after there. Um, so. Yeah, it was it's just a perfect time for it to really explode. And it, it's had, I think since then, slight you know ups and downs, but it's been very consistently a, a favorite book for, for so many of us. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and you also, um, I know we talked very briefly before this video about diversity in Lord of the Rings, because that's something that yeah. we don't get much of in this, this is book. True. And this is something that probably would, this would definitely be critiqued if published today, rightfully so. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I made a video that uh, I told you about that talks about in a more broad sense, um, uh, fantasy in, in relationship to race and gender and, and that sort of thing. And um, Lord of the Rings is in many ways a product of its time, let's just, you know, put it that way. Um, and if you look at J.R.R. Tolkien as a person, he was in, in many respects a very progressive individual. He was a man of deep faith, but he also took very public stances. Um, you know, he was very against Nazis. And for example, uh, he was approached by a German publisher in the late 1930s. And the, the publisher as much as asked him if he was Jewish or not, uh, because they wouldn't have published him if he had been Jewish. Um, so Tolkien wrote back to them and said, well, I, as it happens, I'm not Jewish, but I would be proud to be Jewish if I were, uh, because his last name is German, in fact. Um, and a lot of people um, of Jewish ancestry these days have last names that have German origins. So at any rate, um, he, he very publicly you know, was uh, against Nazis. He spoke out against apartheid in South Africa, the country where he was born, uh, although he didn't live there very long, um, but he was, you know, publicly took a stance against apartheid. So I, I see him as being a very progressive individual in some ways, but also like all of us, a, a product of his time. And you can find in Lord of the Rings and in certain statements that Tolkien made in his own letters and, and, and so forth, um, indications that uh, you know, there are certain elements of Lord of the Rings that uh, haven't aged well, if you, if you want to put it that way, where, where we would recognize now that um, his portrayal perhaps of the Easterlings and the Southrons could be uh, problematic for, for many people. And uh, his inspiration for orcs, uh, he wrote in a letter about this, so that he essentially based them on a certain portrayal of people from the Mongolian steppes, um, which is, you know, uh, uh, yeah, and in the letter, he, this is, he's very clear, this is the European view of people from this part of the world uh, who were, you know, the Huns and that sort of thing that were much feared and loathed invaders of Europe during certain historical periods. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't read well if you read what he wrote in that letter. Um, it, 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 I feel awful reading it because he just very simply explains, yeah, I and this goes back to William Morris in the 19th century who portrayed the Huns in a very similar manner as very 
um, uh, in a very unflattering way, physically and morally. Um, and there's an equation between physicality and morality in there, which I think is problematic too, perhaps. Um, so yeah, and, and you could critique you know, Lord of the Rings for having a very good versus evil kind of dichotomy, uh, a sort of an older, I suppose, view of morality in that sense that there's us, the good guys, and then there's the other, the bad. So it's not that simple, I realize. Lord of the Rings, actually, there is some nuance. You have characters like Gollum, who is um, clearly, he has the capacity for redemption. Um, and then you have good characters like Boromir, who clearly has the capacity for corruption. And that's a very important theme, I think, in, in Lord of the Rings as well. So there's, it's not that there's no moral complexity. I, I would never say that. Um, but nevertheless, there are certain aspects of it. Um, and it's, it's like every single work of literature. You can find very controversial things about some elements of Shakespeare plays, for example, um, certain portrayals in them. Um, you can, you know, it's, it's easier from our perspective to point out these things. And I'm not saying those are not legitimate uh, criticisms, but I think it's also important to understand that we are all products of our time period and we are all limited by that in, in our, our world views. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a big topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do you think about I that? I think you covered that perfectly. I completely agree yeah. with that. I mean, you always have to take into account the historical context and the background of mm -hmm. the writer and everything. And I think you explained that very well. I just think it's an important yeah. thing to worth, worth mentioning. Um, because yeah, it, yeah. You know, I think it is. It's something that we need to be open, open to criticizing. Um, but that doesn't mean that yeah. we can't enjoy it, of course, and uh, see it for what it is, so. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't talk about gender, but that's also, uh, I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, there are zero female characters in The Hobbit, um, and there are only essentially, what, three in Lord of the Rings? Uh, <laughs> and Arwen, really, uh, if, for those of you who are familiar with the films, but not the book, Arwen does not really appear in the books, um, except more in the appendices than in the actual story. Uh, as for Galadriel and um, Eowyn, is probably, for me, Eowyn is the most interesting of the three, but Galadriel is a very idealized. I would never call Tolkien misogynist. He's not misogynist. There is women hating going on in Lord of the Rings, but, but um, there is a kind of erasure. Uh, I think there's a, a problem of lack of representation, maybe in a way, and, and the little bit of representation that's there is very idealized um, in, when, you, when you think about Galadriel, for example. Eowyn is the most interesting of the three to me because you, you clearly do have a woman who has a, a sense of conflict, that there is a social role that she's being called to and that she doesn't want to be called to and that she wants to be a warrior. She wants to fight for, for her people. And in the end, you, you, you know, you, I think you could do an interesting feminist um, critique of, of her, her arc you know, in the end, she ends up. Um, you could you could view her ending as, as as her being domesticated, I suppose, but she has a very important moment, doesn't she? Uh, in in Return of the King, I mean, she's the I mean, she's kind of the hero in a way of the story, uh, or a big part of it anyway, because she's the one who slays the uh, the head Nazgul there. Um, so that's a spoiler. Uh, for, <laughs> everybody knows that, right? Um, but yeah, she plays a very important role, at least in the story. So I'm glad Eowyn's there for sure. Eow Eowyn was actually my favorite of the three female characters as well. Um, I, I did yeah. love the, um, I mean, I did love the idealization, I guess, of Galadriel. I thought it was beautifully portrayed. I mean, She's beautiful. It speaks to every, yeah. it's so funny because I, I come from the music world and the voice world. And I remember when I was um, studying music and voice, my voice teacher at the time made a joke about how every girl wants to be an opera so star or a singer because they want to live out that uh, that that fairy tale that I'm a fairy kind of <laughs> fantasy that they have as children or something like that. Which is, I know that's probably not every child anymore, but um, but in a way, I kind of saw Galadriel that way, that sort of idealized fairy um, beauty and you know woman so she was very intriguing in that way i i just yeah. i thought she was fascinating um but i also yeah it was a little 
disappoint. It is a little disappointing if you watch the movie first, probably, and expect to see more Arwen yeah. and to find out she is more in yeah. the appendix than she is actually in the story. Um, but I completely agree with what you said about Eowyn. She was my favorite of the three. Um, and because of that, because she has those conflicts. And, and, and it's also, you know, I mean, that it probably, even though we're criticizing the sort of um, the female, uh, basically the female characters in Lord of the Rings or lack thereof, yeah. I mean, she was a shield maiden. And I think that probably did appeal, at least at the time, to women to see a woman in that role who wanted to be a fighter rather than just somebody to be. Uh, but then again, I guess you could also bring up the view you brought up, which is that she sort of chose the more domestic path at the end. But it was her choice. So I kind of appreciated that too. I don't mm -hmm. know. She's definitely somebody worth exploring more, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you could have a very nuanced analysis, I think, of, of that character for sure. But yeah, you mentioned the Shield Maiden, and that's a concept that Tolkien definitely got from Old Norse and, and, and the old material. He had a lot of, obviously, as we all know, this is a lot of great inspiration in, in the actual medieval, the Old English and in the Old Norse and, and uh, some of the Finnish stuff, the Kalevala and so yeah, he, he was a man who was uh, just very well read and, and a lot of those inspirations he just poured into this mythology, this beautiful world that he built, so yeah. Yeah, that was actually something I saw a tiny bit of in the on fairy stories too, just a tiny bit. And he even made one short mention of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I loved his mention of that there too, just talking about how magic isn't something to um, to be joked about or to, I can't remember, mm. like in satire or whatever, that that's not the thing that is the joke or the, I, I can't remember exactly how he put it, but it was just so oh, interesting yeah. to see that. Um, yeah. And of course, I think like he, I, yeah, he also had, a, as you mentioned, his career in languages. Um, mm -hmm. So that definitely, and it seemed, so that was influenced I guess in part by, uh, so he, he studied languages, but I guess he also studied, like you said, Old Norse and as well as, and I guess Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, as I learned from you is uh, Middle Ages, right? Yeah, it's Middle English, yeah. Middle English, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yes. not, not Old English, but Middle English. Middle yeah. English, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so he had these different influences historically. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I think that point you were talking about when, when you were mentioning Sir Gawain and the Green Knight um, in regard to fairy stories and all that, which people have had a tendency to, to, to dismiss. And we're familiar with this in fantasy. There's this tendency to dismiss fantasy as, oh, that's just silly magic and elves. And, and, and uh, that's for ch children. That's children's stuff. Um, and this is what Tolkien was objecting to. And, and, and I think he's, he was one of the first to point this out that fantasy taps into, yes, the unreal, the imaginative, the magical, in order to convey important truths. And it has a very, I think, unique capacity to do that. And so that's one of the points I think he's making in here, that this is very high, very serious stuff at times as well, that you can convey uh, universal human experience through Yes, elements that we know they're not real, but while you're immersed, that's a great word, while you're immersed in that world, it feels real. And you come back to our world from that experience with a slightly different view of things, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so yeah, you can wrestle with stuff while you're in that magical world that you might not be able to wrestle with so easily if you were stuck here. So it, it performs a very important function, doesn't it? Um, so yeah. Yeah, I oh, think you explained that so well. That is exactly what he's saying in this essay. Yeah. yeah. About like not uh, le learning to work through things and everything, like not being a, I think he yep. said like a prisoner or something to certain yep. things. Yes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Excellent. <laughs> so maybe I'll go to another question if we have Sounds time. Good. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why do many in academia, even now, scoff at Tolkien's works as unliterary? Is that true? Do you think? I, I, I don't, yeah, well, that's a question for you, for sure. Yeah. So first of all, big sigh. Um, <laughs> I think it's true 
maybe less true now than it was at a certain time. Although the genre in general, I mean, I, I made a video that uh, you saw um, about an essay that uh, the author Salman Rushdie wrote about the um, celebration of the fantastic in literature. And I agreed with the vast majority of what Rushdie was writing in that essay. I think he made some wonderful points about, and we were just talking about this, how fantasy can uh, absolutely capture the array of, of human experiences. And that is a very important thing. It's a very, it can, it function. It, there's this false distinction that we make through labels, labels like genre fiction, which is, it's, it's disdainful, unfortunately. Or, or, and we talk about literature as if only certain type of story is somehow worthy of criticism. And I, I think that this is a disservice both to the genre fiction and the literature because it denies the fact that there are some important themes that you can wrestle with through something like fantasy, but it also denies the fact that the greatest stories are entertaining, they're fun, um, they're, they're great. You know, there, there are these um, great plays by this guy called Shakespeare for example, you know, <laughs> yes, there's some really cool philosophy in there, but he also tells some very crude jokes and uh, there's violence and there's sex and there's all this stuff in there that we somehow, um, I think falsely associate with lower kinds of, of, of writing. So, um, and, and really it, it, I think that every story has the capacity to enlighten us and to entertain us. And this is a wonderful thing. And yes, some stories will tend more toward the enlightening where they, have, they really delve into the themes and everything, but those stories tend to be kind of boring if they don't have some entertainment element to them. And, you know, some stories are much more about entertainment and, and uh, you know, just getting lost in the story and, and escapism. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, I, for me personally, I also do like to read a story that has some themes in it that I can wrestle with and, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I just think that uh, it's unfortunate that we often hear this very snobbish. I think a lot of times it's just like your classic bully who likes to feel good by putting somebody else down. Um, and that's academic bullies being mean to genre fiction, you know. Uh, but Tolkien, there's a lot of great scholarship on, on Tolkien. We were talking about the one scholar earlier, Tom Shippey, uh, he's one example. And there, there are a lot of great, really, there's a lot of good stuff on Tolkien. And I hope there'll be an increasing amount of, of uh, scholarship on, on others. I think that one uh, series that is just waiting for, I'm, I'm probably wrong about this, there probably are dissertation, dissertations already, but uh, one series that could definitely support a lot of dissertations would be the Malazan Book of the Fallen and the Malazan world in general. Um, so yeah, there's lots of great work waiting to be done on, uh, on fantasy. And, and it is absolutely a, a genre that supports uh, critical exploration. Um, so no doubt about that. Yes, I will go ahead and link Philip's um, video down below because everybody should watch it. It is so good. I, d I definitely want to read that essay just out of curiosity, but I definitely agreed with everything you said in that video and just now too. And um, yeah, it's just, it's interesting the way that these labels kind of work against mm, the argument that the people are trying to make <laughs> in a way, yeah. um, or just to put, make such dichotomies in any way. Um, so that's well, really I think we, what we do is we dismiss things with labels. You know, we hang a label on someone um, and that could be in so many different realms. That could be in literature, it could be in politics, it could be in, you know, wherever, but we, we hang a label and then dismissed, you know? Mm -hmm. Not much, that's a knee jerk reaction. That's uh, not a very thoughtful response. Um, and it's a false response in, in the sense that you are denying the complexity that actually exists by applying this label. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure, everybody can relate to that. You know, I've been called some labels in my time. Um, and I'm, you know, I kind of think, well, no, I'm actually, there's more to me than that. But to that person at that moment, I am that label, uh, unfortunately. And I think it's a lazy way of going through life. 
uh, labeling people and things like that. Um, but I'm certainly guilty of it sometimes myself. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about that for myself too, because I think there have definitely been times where I have had to call, I've been called out and I've called myself out on being a bit of a musical snob. And um, I, I think the more that I've learned about music, which it's like, what do I know? I really don't know anything. <laughs> like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Um, and I just feel like there, I just try not to see it that way anymore. Like I've opened my mind up so much to like when it comes to singing, for example, for example, that there are so many different types of good singing and you know, why, why does it have to be just one way and that's considered good or um, worthy of criticism or, criti you know, respect in some way. So I think it's important to, to just recognize that because this person probably meant well in this essay, but uh, yeah. it's pretty, it's obviously, mm, he's obviously not seeing a lot of things there that I, and I actually kind of wish that you would consider writing, maybe you could consider consider writing a paper uh, in response to that essay. Wow, so you're giving me an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, you did a wonderful video. Why not write a paper now? So. <laughs> Great idea, actually. That would be a wonderful thing to even consider for like a, a conference or something. Uh, that would, could be fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. And maybe let's see if there's another, Ryan has comes up with such good questions. And by the way, Ryan is the person who made me aware of Tom Shippey, who I yeah. guess, can you explain what the relationship is between Tom Shippey and Tolkien? Were they, did they know each other? I think they met, uh, but uh, Tom Shippey's obviously, he's still around, I, I believe, and he's a lot younger than, than Tolkien was, but I believe they met at Oxford. Uh, and Shippey's a great scholar. He's a, he's a, Really, very. Uh, I actually am familiar with his some of his work. Um, he does some great stuff with Old Norse, um, but he's in terms of Tolkien scholarship, he's most famous for the concept of asterisk worlds, um, which is a term that he applies to Tolkien's what T Tolkien kind of calls subcreation, um, and um, the whole term asterisk comes from the uh, the notion that when linguists were reconstructing. Indo-European, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but the idea is that there is an, a, an ancestral language that the la most of the languages, not all, but most of the languages of Europe, including the Celtic languages, the Germanic languages, the Latin languages, the Slavic languages, and uh, Greek, and, and um, some of the languages all the way to including Persian, and uh, most of the languages of Northern India, for example, Hindi and um, Nepali, one I speak a little bit of, um, uh, which is in Nepal, obviously, uh, but the Sanskrit-based languages, the ones that are derived from Sanskrit, these were all in some way uh, descended from one common language that we call Indo-European. We don't have any textual evidence for Indo-European. There's nothing written in Indo-European, right? It, there was, uh, we don't know, we only can conjecture that it existed based on linguistic evidence from its descendant languages. So there are words that we recognize as cognates. Um, so for example, very easy examples would be uh, the numbers in, in most, uh, like in, in English, one, two, three, four, five, in German is eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. And you can see they're very similar. And once upon a time, they were the same word. They are all descended from what's called uh, Proto-Germanic, okay? But we also notice the same thing with the Germanic languages and the Latin languages and the Celtic languages. And there's, the languages change over time, obviously. Words change over time. And so they change in different ways. Uh, and so ultimately by kind of reconstructing through all the words that are descended from a common word, we can conjecture with pretty good accuracy, we think, what the original word was. So we know what the Indo-European word for one was, or the Indo-European word for hand, or the Indo-European word for, you know, home or whatever. Um, we don't have any actual evidence. So what scholars would do is they would put an asterisk next to the word to, to say, we don't actually have evidence that this word exists, but we're pretty sure it existed. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, the idea is um, you're, you're reconstructing a world based on, on a bit of evidence that you have in the present. And Tolkien kind of engages in this a little bit based on the mythologies of the past, a, a kind of a, in, in his Middle Earth, which is very 
much anchored in his uh, reading of Old English and Old Norse and Finnish and all the other stuff we talked about before. Uh, he's creating a mythological world that really never actually existed anywhere. But um, so this is kind of Shippy's con. I'm not really doing a great job of explaining it, but that's a, a central concept that, that Shippy is kind of famous for um, explaining. Oh, yeah. that's so interesting. It, it made yeah. me think of um, reading through the saga of the Volsungs and how yeah. I would constantly see footnotes that would say, we think this word means this or this. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. This is what uh, scholars of uh, Tolkien engaged in this sort of thing all the time as a, a, a scholar of uh, Old English. Um, you're, you're constantly conjecturing in, in about what words might have been and because the manuscripts and often are damaged and, and burnt and old and, and uh, there, are, there are scribal errors. And, and so um, deciphering Old English is, is very much an exercise in sometimes the imagination um, and filling in gaps and, and things like that. So, um, and wow. humble in acknowledging that. Um, and, and Tolkien was great about that. He, he was a, um, he was a scholar, but he was also very much a person who understood stories really well. And he was a popularizer of, of things uh, like fantasy, but even Beowulf, before Tolkien, Beowulf was treated as um, not necessarily a great literary text. It was treated as a, a, a mine for archeologists to look at, okay, what, what kind of uh, burial practices did people have in the past? Or it was treated as a, as a place for somewhat dubious historical evidence and, and that sort of thing. It wasn't treated as a great story. And Tolkien's famous essay called Beowulf colon, the monsters and the critics. It's basically a plea to read this as a story, as, as a piece of literature. And so Tolkien is in many ways a, a very important figure in Beowulf scholarship because he's the one that basically said, let's read this as literature. It's a great story. Uh, and so he, yeah, he's profoundly important uh, for that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it was just my imagination or what I was I don't know if I made this up in my head, but I really did feel like when I started the Lord of the Rings this time, when I started the Fellowship of the Ring, I I, I had read reread Beowulf earlier this year for that read along with Andy yeah. Smith. And that was so wonderful. But I'll link that below too because that discussion was just fantastic. Um, well, I had a good time talking with Andy about Beowulf. I loved it. I loved it. I it just it was fantastic. It made me so appreciative of Beowulf and. I, it just made me want to read more more works like that. Um, anyway, but anyway, the interesting thing was when I started the Lord of the Rings, I I couldn't help but think about Beowulf while I was reading it. I don't know what it was in my subconscious that was making making some sort of connection between the two. Do you have any insight about that? <laughs> I mean, well, I first of all, I think Tolkien would have been very pleased by that. Um, <laughs> but yes, there there are. First of all, there are a lot of nods in Tolkien's work toward Old English that are, some are just fun, like Bilbo stealing the cup to upset Smaug uh, is, is an episode taken right out of Beowulf, where a thief steals a cup and, and pisses off a dragon that, that wreaks destruction. As oh, a that's true, yeah. Um, so there are lots of these kinds of nods and, and, and the names of, of many of the characters, particularly the Rohirrim. Uh, these are basically um, Old English uh, type people, Anglo-Saxon people, uh, who are much better at riding horses than the Anglo-Saxons actually were. <laughs> yeah. um, but their names are Old English. Theoden means prince in Old English. Uh, Eomer means horse fame. Eowyn means horse joy. Um, in Old English, a lot of other names, uh, Saruman is, is Old English uh, for a very clever kind of mechanical kind of thinker. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are clues in the names uh, often uh, of uh, who these characters are. Um, so there is that, but there's also these really deep, important thematic echoes from Old English. One of the most important themes in Old English poetry is the idea of life's fleetingness. Mm, that, yeah. uh, you know, we are here and everything is temporary and all our friends are gonna be gone, our family, treasure, all the things that we prize, all these things are, are temporary and fleeting. Um, and this is, there's some really poignant, beautiful lines of Old English poetry uh, that deal with this theme. 
That's huge in, in, in Lord of the Rings. The idea of, of uh, you know, time passing us and, and the past and, and the lament. Beowulf is a lament for the past more than anything. Tolkien, more than anyone, uh, shows us that in that same part. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and you feel, because Tolkien was so brilliant at creating these layers and layers of history and mythology, you feel the weight of the past and you feel the sorrow of things that were but are no longer. It's, it's just so deeply beautiful. Um, and you get an even bigger sense of this if you read the Silmarillion and you know why Galadriel is in, in Middle-earth and, and what brought her there. Um, and then you really understand her sorrow. Um, and you, it's just so beautiful. And this comes from Old English. This comes from his, his grounding in, in medieval literature. And so the very essence of, I think, his story is, is very much relatable to the themes that you have in, in uh, particularly Old English and Old Norse. Um, and just, it's, it's pervasive. That influence is pervasive. Um, and Finnish, I mentioned as well, the Kalevala is something, um, I mean, there are certain obvious things, like he based one of his Elvish languages on Finnish and another one on Welsh. Sindarin is based on Welsh. Um, and the more, the more high Elvish one is based on Finnish. But it also the Kalevala, the story, um, Tom Bombadil, for example, is an echo of uh, a very important character in the Kalevala. I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, so sorry for all you Finnish speakers, but something like Vaina Moinen or something like that. Um, and he's this old man with a big beard, and he sings his magic, and he sings stuff into being. And um, so it's just, there are all these wonderful things that Tolkien has taken from this older literature, but most importantly, the themes. And, and that's why you, I think you probably feel that. Yeah, that would, that would make perfect sense. And I think that was one of the, mo the most beautiful things about uh, Beowulf. Um, one of the more bittersweet things is that theme of life's fleetingness, definitely. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, we covered, I still have more questions, but I feel like we've covered so much. <laughs> yeah, we've so been going think, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we can go ahead and if there's anything else you wanted to share or any parting words about Lord of the Rings. Well, I, you know, if there are any of your viewers out there who haven't read it yet, um, you know, I would encourage them obviously to read it and give it a little time because it is a little bit older. There's more description than you're probably used to if you're a reader of modern fantasy. There's probably more description and more exposition, but I think once you get immersed in that, once you get used to it, you begin to appreciate it and then you start to love it even. And then you might even go back to some of the more modern uh, fantasy and think this is a little bit bare for me. Um, so I, you know that I've, I've had people tell me that. So, um, but, but yeah, give it a try. It's beautiful. And the only other thing I wanna say is thank you so much, uh, Joanna, for, for this really fun discussion. I had a really great time and I love talking about Tolkien and, and Middle Earth anytime, but it's really special to be able to talk with somebody like you. Um, it's just great to have my, uh, my fellow lovers of stories and, and fantasy out there to, uh, to connect with and, and to just geek out, you know? Yes, I love geeking out with you, Philip, anytime. <laughs> it's such an honor to have you on my channel, finally. And thank you so, so much for taking the time to share your expertise here and your love of this wonderful work of literature that I hope everybody will read too. And again, if you're interested, please check out Seeking Stories. I'll link down, I'll, I'll link Seeking Stories down below as well. So if you're interested, you could join that read along. Um, but in any case, I hope everybody will read this because it is fantastic. So thanks again, Philip. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Right.